بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على محمد خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم افتح فتوه العارفين آمين. اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك آمين. وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام الحمد لله praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and send salawat always and forever on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the one who always replies to yours always replies to us but we heard that so in heartwarming and beautiful how can a, how can somebody love you so much we haven't met him but he knows of us he's mentioned us to his ashab in his time all them years ago that's how much he loves us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our tongues always moist with the dhikr of Allah and dhikr of his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we're living in times that are really like it drains us down we hear all these doom and gloom that we see it on the news and whatever you see around the world and people are just fighting attitudes of throats, people are being attacked, all these things we're seeing and it just drags you down. But if we think we've had it hard, read the lives of the Prophet Sallallahu the lives of the Anbiya that came before him, read the lives of the Sahaba, those that were the closest to the Anbiya were tested the most. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ashaddu al-Bala'i, the most tested out of all of the people of, of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Anbiya, thumma al-Amthal, fal-Amthal, fal-Amthal. The Prophet's the first, then those who closely mimic them, and then those who are closest to them, and then those who are close to them, and so on and so forth. So the more closer you're going to be to the Prophet ﷺ, you're going to be tested. And our little in this time is a lot. Whereas the Sahabas, a lot was demanded of them in that time. And if they even left a little, they would be held to account. But it's through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he knew that there was going to be this like, decline and these dark times were going to come. But it's, it's as if we've forgotten the messages. And we feel that we've got the hardest and the worst kind of troubles. Everybody's, everybody you ask, everyone's goes, going through some sort of a, a, a turmoil inside of them. There's some sort of you know, uneasiness inside of their hearts. I've got the problems. All the worries are on my shoulders and in my heart. I've got too much stress and I've got too much anxiety. It's because we've stopped being Athala akun abdan shakura. As the Prophet says, shall I not then be a grateful servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Only if we were to look with the eye that he wanted us to look at, grateful servants of what Allah has blessed you with. That we've got, we've got hands, we've got limbs, everything's beautiful. But it always, Allah, that's right, the shaitan wants you to believe that it's worse in your case and everybody else will get it easier. That's ungratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's given you everything. Every single thing that is only for a moment for you to look. Try to count the favors of your Lord because you're never going to be able to enumerate them, but nonetheless try because that's a starting point for us. Sheikh Saadi Rahmatullah, we were speaking about him last week, and I've been mesmerized by his kalam, his beautiful Rahmatullah. You should read about this beautiful, you know, the, the Persian poetry that he would come with. He mentions a story about a beautiful um, uh, a, a king. This, this king was traveling on a ship and it's a, it's a complex uh, long point but at the end of it he mentions the story about this king who's uh, traveling on this ship with the other travelers and he has a gulam with him who's never ever been on a ship before and there's other passengers on this ship and they're all going along so the, as they leave the port 
this gulam who's never been on this ship, who's never been on the rough waters, he says, no, this is not too bad. It's nice and smooth. But as soon as they get into deep water, suddenly the waves start hitting. And as soon as the waves start hitting, every single time he has a, a wave hitting his ship, he starts screaming out loud. And he does that for every single uh, time that the, the tide would hit the ship. He would let out a scream. Now that you can just you can pass it off as a normal story. But it wasn't for the people who were on the ship because it's a long journey and this guy's going every it's like you got a snooze button that just doesn't want to go off. It's like it's not working. So he just keeps going on and on. He's screaming, screaming, screaming. Amongst the passengers, there was another uh, uh, a wise scholar, a sheikh. So he says, he says, he says, oh king, he says, he goes, if you give me permission, I know how to keep this make this guy shut up. I can I can keep I can make him keep quiet. He says, he goes, I've tried everything. He says, I've even ordered him as the king. He says, if you want to try, go ahead, you do it. So Sheikh Saadi Rahmatullah says, he says, this Sheikh, he says, he goes, but I need two volunteers or two helpers. So he gets two of the strongest uh, people on the passenger list. He says, right, you two, grab hold of him. He says, what you do? He goes, we'll take him right to the front of the ship and we'll dunk his head right in the water. He says, do that. He says, and just when he's about to pass out, he says, let him out. So he, and he's, he's doing the same thing. He's screaming even worse now. He says, dunk him again. He dun dunks him a second time. And he does the third time and a fourth time. After that, when he thinks he's ready, he says, right, bring him back, put him in his seat. And there's no screaming. So the king's amazed. He says, he says he goes, I tried everything. I'm the king. I ordered him to shut up. He didn't. How did you do it, oh wise person, oh wise sheikh? So he says, it's easy. He says, I dunked his head so much that he understood the fear of being drowned. Before he had no fear of drowning. And so he was more, uh, yeah, he didn't have the concern for the ship. And he's, he's, he's quite poetic and he, as he uses in poetry. So what he's trying to say, Sheikh Sadi Rahmatullah he says when he didn't know the fear of drowning, he was too worried about his ship. Now he understands the worth of the ship because it's keeping him away from being drowned. And then Sheikh Saadi Rahmatullah turns it and he says, he says, this is what the lesson that we need to learn. That we're too busy trying to look at our problems when all we need to do is look further. Other people who can't even lift their hands. There's other people that have spent eids upon eids inside the hospitals. There's other people that have got un incurable diseases. There's other people that you know, can't walk or can't talk. You've got a roof over your head. People are on the streets. One single moment that there were kings in, in Syria and places like that, and instantly they're taken, everything's taken away. Everything of the blessings, when we look at them, ours fall shy. Sheikh Saadi, rahmatullah he mentions a story about him. Sheikh Saadi, when he was in Damascus at that time. So when he, when he came out of the D Damascus, uh, the Grand Umayyad Mosque, that's where he was on the day of Juma. So he comes out of Juma and said, beautiful, may Allah bless that place. May Allah bring it back to the former glory, inshallah. Amen, amen. And, and save all the people and its inhabitants of the blessed lands of Sham. Sheikh Saadi, rahmatullah he comes out of Juma. As, as he comes out of Juma, he finds out that his shoes have been nicked. His hisa have gone mafkud, they've, they've been lost. That's an old age, age old problem. <laughs> it even happened in them times. <laughs> uh, nothing personal. <laughs> they were there at that time as well. Sheikh Saadi, rahmatullah says, he says, he goes, oh, I've been, they've taken my only slippers that I had. He says, forget it, he goes barefooted. He starts walking in, in, the, in the streets of Damascus. And as he's walking in the streets of Damascus, Sheikh Saadi Rahmatullah is walking and suddenly he has a thought in his mind. Look at this now, just a thought. He hasn't said anything. He says, he says, he says I'm walking barefooted. People think of me as the great Imam, the great Sheikh, the great so-and-so. He's just saying this in his heart. This is just whispers going on inside. He says, they think of you as such and such a person and you are so feeble or so weak that you can't even afford to buy a new pair of slippers. How, how bad are you? That thought just came into his mind. And they say that the more closer you are, the more beloved you are to Allah, the quick Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you to task. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him, not two weeks later, he took him there and then he says, and he showed him a mandhar. He made him see a sign straight away. So he thought that as soon as he saw that, he was worried about his slippers. 
He says he saw a man that was, yani from the hips down, he had no legs at all. And he was crawling along the floor. <laughs> Sheikh Sa'adi Rahmatullah says, Ya Malik, he let out a big scream. And he cried out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, he says, Ya Allah, at least you've given me some legs to walk on. He says, shoes not today, don't worry, I'll get some tomorrow. He says, that's not a big deal. He says, but Ya Allah, what you have given us, may we, may we never ever move our eyesight away from the blessings that you've given us. This is from the beautiful tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Unduru ila man asfala minkum. He says, look to those who are always below you or less fortunate than you. That way you'll always have shukr for what you've got. Don't look at the people who are above you. That's not the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, look for the people who are below you or less fortunate than you. You've got hands, you're mourning that you haven't got this, this uh, clothing or these trainers. You've got feet that you can walk on. You've got a voice that you can still talk. You've got eyes that you can still see. All of these blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're the blessings that you need to home in on. And only when you look at people who haven't got hands, who haven't got a tongue, who, can't, you know, who, who are bedridden, who, who can't do the things, who can't come to majalis like this. And they're the masakeen. And then we know the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has afforded us. These are the true blessings that we need to focus and home in on. These are the things that will be, and you never ever look towards those above you, ever. Ever look towards above you. Why? Because that's always going to make that tama and that want greater. It was going to be haris on dunya. You're going to be wanting dunya. You're going to be craving for dunya. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you are to look for those who are above you, then look in deen. Look for in deeny matters, look to those who are above you. Why? Because then you're always going to be aspiring to get something better. I pray my five daily prayers, but whoa, he prays the hajjun. He gets up at night. I, I, I give my zakat, but he gives his sadaqah. He said, I, I do my little bit around the house, but he helps the community. He's doing this. and this. Always look at them who are going to be better than you. Why? Because you aspire to do greater. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, strive with one another to do what good deeds. That's what striving is there. I yeah, always look to those who are above you in religion. As for everything else, always look to those who are less fortunate than you. That's the, that's the starting point and that's the ending point. We have been so blessed so much that Allah has made us from insan. And we're from humans, from the same stock as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're not from we're not some Baha'im that are roaming around in some fields, no purpose of life, they're just chomping on grass. Allah has given us intellects. Say alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And that's where we need to start. We need to start that we are sentient beings, that we have aqal. We, Allah has given us his aqal so we can know Allah and his Rasul. That's what we need to do. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Greatest blessing that He's He's made us from the Ummah of the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we didn't ask for it, we didn't get it, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we, we don't deserve it. But it was at our best that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had somebody come over and tell us in our ears that you are not normal, you are from the Ummah of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the one, the one that the Anbiya would ask Allah for, they didn't get. To be from this ummah. The ones that waited for generations and generations, they didn't get. We got it on our first day when we were born. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. That's the one who we should see. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem. He's the Rabb. He's given us that beautiful na'mah. Be grateful for these blessings. And then you're going to see that all your problems shy away. Shy away. Our teacher always used to say whenever we, when I used to, I used to be a mourner. He used to, he used to say, stop mourning. He says, there's always somebody in the world who's got it worse than you. And always look at it like that. You're always going to be smiling. And this is the way we keep that smile. The Prophet Sallallahu he's had tragedy after tragedy after tragedy in his life. But yet he smiled like the most beautiful person that he was. And teaching everybody the great sunnah, the smile. And look at all your blessings, count them, and thank Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for them. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give us tawfiq, inshallah, to be in these blessed gatherings and learning about the the better shamail of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because if it wasn't for the Sahaba we would never know we would have them glimpses of how he was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so we, as we continue in this chapter he says وَأَنْ نَزَالِ بْنِ سَبْرَ Sayyidina نَزَالِ بْنِ سَبْرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى he says 
da utiya alay aliyun bikuzin min ma'in wa huwa fi rahbatin fa akhadha minhu kaffan fa ghasala yadayhi wa madmada wa istanshaqa wa masaha wajhahu wa dhira'ihi wa ra'suhu thumma sharibahu qa'imun thumma qal hadha wudu'u man lam yuhdith hakadha ra'aytu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa'ala this is it's a, it's a, it's a matter of ru'ya. They're telling you what they saw and they're describing to us. So he's saying, Ali brought a jug of water whilst, we, whilst he was in this courtyard. For, and he says, I took... Uh, 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 he says, I took a handful of it and I, did, uh, I washed my hands with it. So he took some water, he scooped some out, he washed his hands. He gargled, he rinsed his nostrils out, he wa- washed his face with it and his arms up until the elbows. Then, whatever was remaining, he drank a little from it whilst he was standing. We're speaking about whether you should stand and sit while, you pr- while you're drinking water. Thumma qal. Then he said, this is the wudu of the one who has got wudu. And he wasn't broke it, do it once. And, he, and why, why is he doing this? Ali radiallahu, why is he doing this? He says, because this is how I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa doing it. So if you, if, you, if you want to wash your hands, that's a bare minimum. You wash your hands before and after, like we said, before the food and after the food. But if you want to be more, then rinse your mouth out after. If you do more, then uh, rinse your nostrils out. Then wash your face and then wash your arms. Wash past your, your wrists. Go right up until your elbows. And that's the way that the Prophet ﷺ says is the wudu of the one who's already got wudu. So it's, it's more like a, a, it's not in the technical sense of wudu. This is like a washing that the Prophet ﷺ would do out of caution. I need to be extra clean. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the ones who want to purify themselves. We're going to come to that inshallah. The next hadith, and Kabshata radiallahu ta'ala anha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, radiallahu ta'ala anha wa ardaha. دَخَلَ عَلَيَّ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَشَرِبَ مِنْ فِي قِرْبَةٍ مُؤَلَّقَةٍ قَائِمًا Allahu Akbar, this is a beautiful hadith. As the Qabshah radiallahu anh, from the Sahabiyyat of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم She says, radiallahu anh, he says that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم entered upon us, I entered in, into our house. And فَشَرِبَ, he drank, he went straight to the water skin, so they would, like I said, they, they used to like, hang these water skins up on the, the rafters of the house, if you will. And, they, and the, there would be an easy part where they can pour from this, this uh, water skin. So this mu'allak qirbatin is the water skin. Mu'allakatin, it was hanging from the roof. Qa'iman. And, and he drank whilst he was standing. How did he drink? Straight from the, the neck of it. Now, there's no difference of opinion over here now. There's another hadith that is Bukhari Sharif Riwaya is mentioned in many places. Bukhari Sharif is the most uh, yani sahih that the Prophet uh, forbade from drinking straight from the, uh, the, the the mouth of it. Why? Because if it's going to be a communal one or somebody else is going to be using, then it's adab that you don't just drink straight from the bottle or the whatever other people are going to be drinking from. Tamam. But the Prophet over here is showing that 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 prohibition isn't one of so it's not haram. It's, it's almost like good advice for you. And this hadith, the, the, he says, uh, that this hadith is showing that it's jawaz, it's permissible. And that's why the Prophet did it. Likewise, standing when he's doing it. He went straight to it and he was standing and drinking. فَقُمْتُ So he says, Hazrat Qabshah radiyallahu radiya ta'ala says, I stood ila fiha. He says, I stood immediately after the Prophet finished. And he says, and I took hold of the, the neck, the, the part that the Prophet touched, and I cut it off. Allah. He says, and I cut it. Why? He says, to get tabarruk from that part which had touched the blessed mouth of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wal istishfa, and to seek shifa from it. And tell the people who are going to deny that. This hadith. Sahih of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they know where their reality is. 
that which has touched the blessed body of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa That's a time to be selfish, isn't it? And it's take it off. No one else is getting that. And he says, and the Musani says, Waka a mithlu dalika li Umm Sulaim. Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha wa ardaha, same thing happened to her. Likewise, you're not going to come, he doesn't mention it here, but Umm Ayman, Baraka, same thing happened to her. You're going to see all of these rewind. There's going to be multiple there different stories where the Prophet said, would, eat, would, would the Sahaba would see it happening, they would cut the end off. He said, right, this is, this is for me and my family. This is, if you want to touch, you can touch, but you, no, one's getting, no one's getting that mouthpiece now. It's mine. Like, who's going to give that up? That's what Umm Sulaim did. That's what Kamsha did. And, and it shows that Whatever that blessed being of the Prophet Sallallahu from top to bottom, every single part of it, Subhanallah, every part of the body of the Prophet Sallallahu from the hair, from the from the skin, from from the clothing that touched, the shawl, the blessed you know the amama, the tassel that goes behind everything, anybody they would just they would just run towards it. When the Prophet would cut his hair, they would they would be pouncing on it as if I want that strand of hair. I want, and that's how they are preserved even to this day. You're gonna see when the Prophet would be doing wudu, the Prophet they would not let a single drop touch to the ground. That they would be trying to grab hold of it and take it, put it into the utensil. The Prophet would be sleeping. That the Prophet would they would they would be collecting the they would get bottles and they'll be collecting the sweat of the Prophet. And they would they would use it as the beautiful perfume that they would have. Uh, our ouds and everything, forget them. This is the, the blessed sweat of the Prophet. And when he would walk into in, in down streets, hours and days later you can still smell him. People who witness Allah Akbar, people who see the Prophet in their dreams, that room, that bedroom is transformed into most fragrant rooms. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a beautiful scent in our rooms, inshallah, in our homes, inshallah. This is, we need to understand that it's a bit more than our superficial vision that we see with. That what the Sahaba saw, they're giving you glimpses that they're not just seeing a water skin. They're not just seeing the end of a water skin that he saw as use. They're seeing something else. They would take shifa. They don't need doctors in Medina in them days. And they had the athar of the Prophet They had the Prophet with, him, with them. Always in their hearts, in their homes. And then whatever he touched, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahu Akbar. And the Prophet Sallallahu hadith, he says the Prophet Nafakh. So the word Nafakh in the Arabic language, that to uh, to blow, but with, with some sort of like sometimes with a bit of like it's in between us, like you're spitting and, and a blowing. That's nafakh. The Prophet never ever did that over food. Wala sharabin or any drink. Wala yitanafasu with the scene. Or he did he never did tanafas, that he never breathed into any utensil. For the obvious reasons, as as they mentioned in the shar. That if you're going to be doing nafakh, sometimes your saliva could come. And if you've been eating, sometimes some food could go back into the drink or the food. They can spoil it for people who are you, you're sharing with, etc., etc. But that's not the case over here. He says, وَذَلِكَ تَعْلِيمٌ لِلْأُمَّةِ He says, this, in this case, is only for educating us. وَإِلَّا فَنَفَسَهُ الشَّرِيفِ وَرِيقُهُ الشَّرِيفِ because as for his blessed spittle or his blessed breath or his blessed uh, you know uh, saliva it is that which people would take shifa from so there's no issue about any harms it's for us to understand that you better not do that because your saliva isn't like the saliva of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam allahu akbar wa kana sallallahu alaihi wasallam idha shariba تنفس ثلاثا ويقول هو أهنأ وأمرع وأبرع. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he would drink, that he would he would breathe three times. That doesn't mean in the uh, vessel, i.e. outside of the vessel. So the Prophet ﷺ would would then would take, for example, a sip. He would breathe out of it, take a second sip, breathe out of it, take a third sip. And breathe out, and then after that he'll continue. You could have it. You can have it in one sip as it comes in the hadith, 
or you can have it in little sips as which is really good for you and why did the Prophet ﷺ teach us that way? He says this is the easiest for you to drink with and it's easiest for you and your body وَأَمْرَعُ and it's most quenching for you it'll take away your thirst more better than you just gulping, guzzling the whole bottle down or whatever وَأَبْرَعُ and it's more healthier for your kidneys and your, and your, and your system inside as well all these benefits and he's just giving you that as a side thing he's saying that's the way he salasa did it different some different why said that he, he breathed twice that way you have a sip you take a breath out you have another sip and then you take a breath outside of the the container and then the third one you're going to be taking it all the way and in however if you want to have it in one or many that's entirely up to you and that's the easiest way and the best way to do it وَكَانَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا شَرِبَ تَنَفَّسَ مَرَّتَيْنِ that he, In this riwayah he says that the Prophet ﷺ had two breaths outside وَرُبَّمَا كَانَ يَشْرُبُ بِنَفْسِ وَعِدٍ حَتَّى يَفْرُغَ And then after that وَرُبَّمَا over here it continues It's the same hadith He says that he would then continue and sometimes he would even have it in one uh, breath حَتَّى يَفْرُغَ for, for the remainder And then he would finish the rest of it sometimes just in one uh, gulp after that That's after the third if you will the third or after the third. وَكَانَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَشْرَبُ فِي ثَلَاثَةِ أَنْفَاسٍ The Prophet ﷺ would drink from with three breaths. وَإِذَا Or three gulps we can translate it as well. وَإِذَا أَدْنَ الْإِنَاءَ أَدْنَ الْإِنَاءَ إِلَى فِيهِ سَمَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى So when the, and when the Prophet ﷺ would take the, the, the cup or the, the utensil towards him, he would say, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا أَخْرَهُ حَمِدَ اللَّهِ And when he would take it back away, after he's taken the sip, he said Alhamdulillah. So it starts with Bismillah, ends with Alhamdulillah. Yaf'alu dhalika thalathan, he'll do that three times. So in the three sips, that's one way of doing it as well. Wa kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yatanafasu fil inai bal yanhanifu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu would never breathe into the utensil. So now he's, he's clearing it. So in case you've misunderstood the hadith, he said it's not that he was breathing inside. He never did that. He is always outside. He means breathing outside and then taking a gulp. But yan hanifu anhu that he would turn away, or so so he keep the cup there. He would turn his head away to take the breaths, and then he would carry on drinking. That's the way the Prophet sallallahu drank. Wa atahu maratan bi ina in fihi asalun wa laban, and uh, on one occasion that he uh, uh, a utensil was brought to him which had. Uh, milk inside which was mixed with honey and he and, and he refused to drink it he says because this is two drinks in one drink and this is two like con- uh, two uh, foods in one in one so then I'll come I'm going to continue with this ثُمَّ قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, And then he clears it. He says, لَا أُحَرِّمُهُ In case you're imagining, he says, and this is not haram, so don't worry about it. وَلَكِنِّي أَكْرَهُ الْفَخْرَ وَالْإِسَابَ بِفُضُولِ الدُّنْيَا He says, but he says, but I don't like to uh, be extravagant. Or I don't like to be accountable for these, um, these uh, delicacies of this world. بِفُضُولِ الدُّنْيَا For the excesses of this world. غَدًا tomorrow. وَحِبُّ الطَّوَاضُ And he says, I, I love humbleness لِرَبِّ يَزَّ وَجَلْ فَإِنَّ مِنْ تَوَاضَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ For indeed the one who humbles himself, Allah raises him up. May Allah make us of the humble ones, inshaAllah. Allah Akbar. This, and this happened in the time of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. He's a Khalifa of Islam. After the demise of the Prophet Abu Bakr Siddiq becomes the second Khalifa, the first Khalifa rather. He's the, 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 the Khalifa to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Hazrat Umar then takes after He's a Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So he's, he's taken after Abu Bakr Siddiq His time, you're going to see the greatest expansion The greatest expansion of the, you know, the, the Islamic lands if you will At that time he goes to a, a place which they've just uh, You know, just come under the rule of Islam And he's presented with the same thing Laban wa Asal and as soon as he's presented it, the first thing he says, he begins to cry. And he says, he says, I, said, I don't want this drink. So the people, they were happy that he goes, you know, he's a Khalifa. He's coming to our lands. We're going to give him a special drink. And suddenly he's refused. They were like, have we done something wrong? Have we, have we offended you in every way? So he says, no, 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 this is not haram. 
It's, it's, it's just that I haven't seen my Rasul Sallallahu ever drinking so, some of these luxuries. Nor have I seen my Sahib, Abu Bakr Siddiq, ever drink anything like this. And he's speaking about his time. Allahu Akbar. What simple lives. They're the Khalifas of the great Islamic empires. They could have easily had them enjoying them luxuries. But if they didn't see him Sallallahu doing it, they said, we're not going to do it. And look at that following. That's, that's Ishq. Ask Ishq, not the, not the words that we share. We are Ashiq of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are just lip service. They, they live that reality. May Allah give us that reality, inshaAllah. Tawadu is a beautiful maqam. Humbleness in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. May Allah make us of them. Wa kana yusta'adhabu lahu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al-ma'u min buyut al-sukhya. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be given to drink water from the uh, buyut al-sukhya. Buyut al-sukhya was a name of a... Uh, a well, Buyut Sukhya was the name of a well that was outside of Medina. It took it was it was a two days travel outside of Medina, but you would have the real sweet water. So they would get that. They would bring it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is he have some uh, special water. That's there in Medina. All the wells are special. Biraha of Abu Talha. It's inside of Medina. It's beautiful, sweet water. But whenever anybody would go, it's like this. It's a like a special a speciality of that region. They were bringing it back. And every well used to have its own kind of a flavor. And you can see that when we were in, even in Yemen. There would be certain places that were nearby. They were not so much. They, if there were ones that were more, more further up in the mountains or whatever. That they would get them. They would, they would have a different kind of... You can tell the difference in them as well. So the Prophet would be, would ha- be given water from that. وَفِي لَفْظٍ يُسْتَسْقَى لَهُ الْمَاءُ الْعَذْبُ مِنْ بِئِرِ السُّقْيَا Another, just the wordings change in this next riwayah. He says that he was given to drink from the water that was the sweet water or fresh water from the bit uh, sukya or bit sukya. Same word. It's the same well. قال ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى ابن القيم رحمه الله عليه mentions ولم يكن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يشرب على طعامه لألا يفسده. الله أكبر. Yeah, the question arises. You always hear this when, when you go for, uh, uh, when when you go to like uh, communal like feasts. Is it better to have the water before, after, during? We've had doctors say so and so. And it's better to do it before or better to do it after. Ibn Qayyim says the Prophet sallallahu never drank uh, water with his food. Okay, li Allah yufsiduhu, so that it wouldn't spoil. The, the the food like when he speaks about drinks a, any drinks over here it doesn't mean just water sorry any kind of drink so if he's had uh, for example uh, milk with something which is going to be having which is oily or meat etc it'll, it'll change the taste so that's why he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, mix the two up together and and it goes without saying he says water which is uh, piping hot or water which is extremely freezing because that could be ha- extremely harmful rather the Prophet Sallallahu would rather blow it in it if it's too hot he would do sabr he says do sabr and wait for it to cool down and naturally cool down and don't stick it in the, in the freezer or something to let it cool down and if it's and it's the sunnah that he would have it he wouldn't have it at boiling temperature he would, he would wait till it comes slightly down and drink it baraka increases as it goes same way with extremely freezing why because you, when you eat something it's like a furnace inside you're having freezing cold water it's going it's going to kill the stomach acids or whatever it is and it's going to make it harder for the digestion if you're going to have it with hot it's going to it's going to it's going to make even the harara even more so it has adverse effects as well. The Prophet would, and he would try not to mix that. After a while he would have it, it is mentioned inside that he would wait and have it after a bit. This is a dua that everyone should learn. It's a beautiful dua. When the Prophet would drink water, he would say, Alhamdulillah. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praise be to Allah, the one, Saqana, Adban. The one who has given us to drink, Adban, that means fresh water, fresh water. Furatan, sweet water, Birahmatihi, because of his mercy. 
Allah made it sweet by His mercy. Allah can make your uh, your bitter drinks sweet by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْهُ And Allah has not made it mil'an, salty, ujajan, bitter, bidhunubina, because of our sins. It is sins that take the withhold rain. You know when people don't have rain, there's a special uh, a prayer that the Prophet will tell us, the istisqa, he says a prayer that you pray. And the whole point of that, that is you're asking for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Imam, what does he do? The Imam subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gathers everybody, the elders with the white hair. He says, get the Prophet says, if it isn't for the elders with the white hair, if it isn't for the young, innocent ones that are innocent, if he says, bring your animals out. Why? Because they're innocent. They don't have any sins upon them. And he says, bring all of them so the mercy can come of Allah. Thereafter, after the salah, the imam, he takes his shawl off. He has to wear a shawl, sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He take a shawl. I'll have to show you this. So if he's got the shawl like this, he'd, he'd take it off and he'd turn it around inside out and then he'd either place it on his shoulders or not at all. he just turn it like that and leave it somewhere. And he's turned it around. Why did he do that? He's doing that to, to, to be significant that, Ya Allah, turn our affairs. We're leaving sins behind. We're leaving disobedience behind. Ya Allah, don't withhold the rain. And as soon as that happens, by Allah, Allah sends down rain. Ask for forgiveness. It makes them fast. The Imam can make the people fast. And it's incumbent upon them to fast. And then on that final day or the third day, whatever, then, then they make a dua commonly for, for rain. Rain, we, you know, we have too much of it. We'll start mourning. That's not what we should be doing. Ask the people. Uh, we're speaking about Nema. Ask the people who don't have rain. Ask the people in South Africa, for example, who are close to like day zero, where they've had no rain yet. Literally, they're going to have to buy water because they can't get it. Ask them the worth of that one gulp. Ask the people near Jordan, in Jordan Valley and all them, how, how precious water is. It's, 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 this price is worth more than gold. We have it and stuff. We should ask Allah and keep asking for forgiveness. It is a, it's because of our sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then turns even sweet water into, into bitter water. That's what we that's a beautiful dua <coughs> of the Prophet. I was intending to finish his chapter. Now he's gonna go into the the vessel that the Prophet would drink with. What was it made of? Was it glass? Was it wood? <coughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Jordan and Tawfiq to gather again inshallah as we continue to find out about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's utensil how he drank and how he drank from it the, uh, the the instruments that he would use now we all want to make our fancy kitchens now know what the Prophet Sallallahu would drink from and try to copy him may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us Tawfiq may Allah make us beloved to Allah by us imitating his beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alim